So, the uh, following program is brought to you by Haymarket Books. And uh, at a time like this, radical ideas are obviously needed more than ever. And um, Haymarket, uh, as well as producing uh, these virtual events, brings out books by Arundhati Roy, Kianga Yamada Taylor, Angela Davis, Naomi Klein, uh, and many other wonderful writers. And uh, if you're moved by any of the program that you're about to see, you can support the work of Haymarket by uh, buying their books from their own website. And even better, you can join the Haymarket Book Club. How about now? Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Natasha Elena Ullman. I'm a writer and immigrant justice organizer, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to thank the organizers and sponsors of this teaching, Haymarket and Verso Books. Haymarket and Verso are two fiercely independent, radical publishing houses. They elevate the voices we all need to be hearing more of right now, Angela Davis, Naomi Klein, Anabel Hernandez, Bernie Sanders, and so many others. We need bold, radical ideas right now, and it's critical we support independent publishers and bookstores. You can do this in a few ways. First, by buying books from Haymarket and Verso. Both Verso and Haymarket have books at 50% off for the next week, so be sure to take a look at their catalog. And second, tonight, if you're in a position to make a donation, no matter how small, via Venmo, there will be a card on the screen about how to do this and folks posting that information in the chat as well. And finally, please consider following Haymarket and Verso on their social media channels and signing up for their newsletters. Haymarket and Verso have uh, more important live streams lined up that I hope you can join. Haymarket's upcoming events include Breakbeat Poets Live, Chapter 1, on Wednesday, May 20th at 5 Eastern, and Tech Won't Save Us, Silicon Valley and the Coronavirus Crisis, with Nicole Ashoff and Rob Larson on Tuesday, May 26th, also at 5 p.m. Eastern. Verso's upcoming lineup includes an online teach-in on class struggle organizing in moments of crisis with Robin D.G. Kelly, Sarah Jaffe, and Asad Haider. That's on May 21st at 6 p.m. Eastern. And on Tuesday, June 2nd, we'll hear from Joanne White Pajewski on sexual politics and Me Too and how we can reject carceral feminism in the fight against sexual violence. We'll drop links in the chat. Just a bit more housekeeping, um, with so many people joining this call, we, we may need your forbearance if we have any technical issues. If your stream gets choppy, it might help to reduce your image quality. Folks will give instructions on how to do so in the chat. Uh, this video will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel, so please like this video, share it with others, and sign up to follow Haymarket on YouTube. We will have some time for Q&A, so please post your questions on the live video feed wherever you're watching. If that's on the Haymarket YouTube or Facebook, just comment on the stream. On Twitter, just post a reaction directly on the video. Now, it's my pleasure to bring in Justin Nakir Chacon and John Washington. Thanks, Nadi. Uh, thanks, Haymarket and Verso. And I'd like to just start by saying to you, Justin, that it's an honor to be in conversation with you. Um, I think your work is essential in not only understanding immigration and migrant politics, but into changing them and to pushing injustices more towards justice. 
um, which is, you know, a large part of what the conversation is going to be about today. Yeah, I, I think I don't know an immigration activist or researcher who doesn't have uh, your book, known as Illegal, on their shelves. Uh, it's it's your and, and Mike Davis's book, um, and it has a new a preface, which is terrific. And if you don't have that on your shelf and you're listening, uh, you should. So um, really, it, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be talking with you. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about my book and try to tell the story of asylum, um, the, the, the long view, and then bring it up to today and to where we are today. Um, and that is, before going back, is that we are currently in an unprecedented crisis of uprootedness. There are, according to UN statistics, over 70 million people who are unroofed and are on the run right now. And by 2050, that number is likely going to balloon to be about 250 million. It could rise to as much as a half a billion by 2050. And to understand this crisis, you have to understand that it stems from another crisis. And that is the gross levels of inequality throughout the world, a gathering acceleration of climate change, and ongoing neoliberal despoilment and extraction. So that's the first crisis. And the second crisis is that the people who are pushed from their homes by those factors, who are chased away by violence, by upheaval, hunger, or poverty, or choicelessness, they are denied a new home. And they are denied any access to relieving themselves of those, those, those push factors. Um, Hannah Arendt wrote, in The Origins of Totalitarianism, she said that what was unprecedented about the 20th century's uh, refugee crisis was not that people lost a home, but that people were unable to find a new home. I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. But uh, so when we take those two factors into account, the first that the all the elements that push people out of their homes and then the politics of nativism or cold hardness or, or whatever it is that denies them a new home that erects borders around nations and communities and hounds people within those communities that throws them into detention centers to modern gulags combines to create a another unprecedented crisis and that is an amalgamated crisis of global apartheid and we are going to see, according to all signs, that get much worse. So it's critical that we understand both elements. And what I try to do in my book, The Dispossessed, is a couple things. One is sort of trace the rise of asylum and refugee policies um, from ancient history to the 20th century to contemporary politics. And then also um, describe and detail the people, some of the stories of people who are affected by those policies, so are either offered safety by them or denied uh, a new home or, or safety or security. Uh, the, the basic idea is that as the world increasingly turns its back, especially right now under the, during the coronavirus crisis, as the world is turning its back on these policies, I argue that it is undercutting really a, a fundamental human principle. And that, that is asylum. That is the idea of offering refuge or safety to, to somebody who's fleeing danger. And the way I try to tell that story is um, primarily through a single person. Though I do profile a few uh, asylum seekers and refugees. And that man is uh, Ardenovis, and he fled El Salvador three times in search of safety. I want to talk a little bit more about his story in a moment. But um, to go back to the first point. Uh, of the history of asylum. So the ideas around these policies, ideas around these cultural practices, um, asylum, sanctuary, even just hospitality, they go back into human history pretty much as far back as we can trace human history. So, and yet what we know of them is really came from the 20th century. This is a response to the, the world wars and the Holocaust. And what was then an uh, unprecedented crisis of statelessness and homelessness. Um, today, the numbers are, are worse. So what happened was after World War II, we saw the first sort of workable global response 
and it was uh, this promise to receive the persecuted. But those ideas came from, uh, you know, earlier in the 20th century, and then you go back centuries and you go back even millennia to different political, institutional, and cultural practices. And what I found was that they were first codified or first institutionalized um, in ancient Greece. And what happened was while uh, maritime technology was advancing pretty rapidly, all of a sudden the Greek islands were much more interconnected. And that brought about increased trade, uh, increased uh, cultural exchange, and also as we read, for example, in Homer, increased despoilment, piracy, and simply war. Uh, and a response to that, that increase of violence and, and despoilment, was to create some sort of protocol. And, and that was where they were setting certain spaces, typically altars or temples, off limits. You couldn't go and pillage an altar or a temple without uh, sort of calling out, enacting some sort of uh, plague or uh, wrath of the gods or even actually political retribution. And so they started marking off those spaces. The word asylum actually comes from that practice, and it's a silos. And silos could be understood loosely as sort of something like piracy or plundering. Um, the Greeks, they had a couple other ways that they sort of uh, enacted similar policies, including the Olympics, so which were not only a celebration of athleticism or contest, but they were it was something like a political detente. And before that, those before the Greeks, there were also, you see in the Semitic religions, that they were codifying, not necessarily institutionalizing or governmentalizing, but codifying some form of asylum or hospitality. Uh, we have the story of Abraham and Sarah, who welcome three angels into their home. They give them water, uh, shade, and bread so that they can refresh their hearts. And there were a number of other uh, legal codes that were written then, which in, sort of called for something similar. It called for the neighbor to receive the other neighbor or the traveler or the person in, in fear. And one of the other things I uncovered besides just tracing this history was that there is a intimate, I wouldn't quite say an integral, but there's an intimate tie between the rise of asylum practices and the rise of the principle of democracy. And so if you think about it, this, this ability to protect, this ability to self-govern and to control and be able to offer refuge and political engagement, they're pretty intertwined, or they, they can be and they should be. And, and that was, we saw them both rising out of those earlier cultures and then into the ancient Greeks. Um, I say principle of democracy because uh, there were certain and very serious limitations. So all of that history said, um, I think an important point here is that in this state of more displacement than we have ever seen in history, uh, almost a quarter billion, maybe half a billion in the next 30 years, uh, we, coupled with the uh, sort of the, the, the sandbagging or the taking away of, or the undercutting of these asylum protocols, what we're seeing is going to be an unprecedented crisis. I've, I've, I've used that word a few times, but it, it's, it was bad, it's gotten worse, and all signs point to it getting even worse. So the inequality and then the refugee and asylum uh, crises raised an order of magnitude. We'll see more death, we'll see more bones in the desert, we will see uh, more dinghies adrift or capsized in the Mediterranean or the South Pacific, and we'll see more and more and more and more people in refugee camps, in detention centers, in gulags. Uh, there's uh, the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova wrote about the 20th century that it was the century of the refugee. And I think that that moniker may have been premature. And I think a lot of people are, are forecasting the same, that 21st century really will be the century of the refugee. Um, you know, another important book on this topic is, is Reese Jones' Violent Borders. And one of the things he does is he counts the number of uh, actual border barriers that are on international borders since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And the, the, the number went from 15 
um, to now over 70. And I think that number is still rising. So we are facing this world um, more sharply divided than ever before, where for those who live on the other side of border walls or the prison bars or the detention bars or the bureaucratic razor wire, basically, um, they are increasingly consigned to uh, what Giorgio Gambin, the Italian philosopher, called bare life. And that is when a human being is reduced to just mere biological existence. And, you know, to, to think about just to bring it home to right now, to think about what is going on currently in uh, U.S. detention systems. We have over 30,000 people currently detained right now, and that number has actually gone down quite a bit in the last year. Um, it was it hit over 55,000. And this is at a time when we know that those people are uh, unsafe. They're, they can't protect themselves from the pandemic that is already taking hold in these detention centers. I talked to a man again today in a detention center. Um, he's from Haiti, and he described to me the, the impossibility of social distancing, again, the shortage of soap, the lack of any anything like uh, hand sanitizer, and the guards who are not practicing uh, the necessary precautions. So that really is one of the most visible, but not nearly the only manifestations of this turning back, turning our backs on asylum and, and refugee policies, on welcoming the stranger, uh, and there are so many others that we can talk about. The number of people who are amassing along the U.S. or just south of the U.S.-Mexico border or who are turned back and deported and, and really left uh, in a state of what I would call de facto statelessness. So um, before I turn to telling a little bit about the story I tell in my book about Arnovis, you know, all of that, and I'm, I'm really emphasizing the importance of asylum and refugee policies, but I'm not purporting to claim that they're a solution by any means. They are a necessary response while we work towards a solution of those global inequalities, of global climate change, all the things I, I, I mentioned. Uh, so to tell you a little bit more uh, briefly about Arnovis, um, he is one of the people who really sort of drives the narrative of my book, and I sort of organize it around him. He comes from a really small rural village in El Salvador along the coast, um, a, a small humble home. He lives about five sandal slapping minutes from a beautiful bay, the Higilisco Bay, about a 15 minute walk from the Pacific Ocean. And even before the spark of his asylum claim, he lived a pretty precarious existence there. Um, there are almost no jobs. Most people live basically uh, by subsistence farming. And about starting 10 years ago, there was an increasingly serious problem with the gangs who came in, uh, really took over political control of the community, started charging rent to people, um, started recruiting the youth and enacting revenge and uh, just pushing their way into people's lives and in people's homes sometimes. And Arnovis tried to keep a low profile and mostly succeeded until uh, one day, he was, he's, a, he's a good soccer player, and one day on a, on a soccer pitch, he got in a tussle with one of the opposing players, and that opposing player happened to be the brother of the leader of uh, one of the gangs in the town. So they uh, tried to get their revenge against him. He then, uh, the other gang, the rival gang, came in and tried to offer him protection and tried to recruit him, and he resisted, and things escalated very quickly. And a sympathetic gang member told him that if he didn't leave, he was going to die. So he was urging him to leave because he didn't want to kill him. And so he did. And he, the, the, the story I sort of detail as much as possible in the book is a, a lot about his journeys. He took three journeys to try to get to the United States and ask for protection. He was deported once from Mexico. He made it up through Mexico again. He rode a train. He was kidnapped. He was shot at. He escaped a safe house. Uh, really a harrowing journey, made it to the United States, asked for protection, was denied, deported for the third time because he had no possibility of living in his home. He left, but this time he took his daughter with him, who was six when he when, when they left together. And this was in, the May of 20, in May of 2018, which, as I'm sure many of you recall, was 
at the very beginning of what we've basically dubbed the, the family separation crisis. They themselves had another harrowing journey. They were 54 hours at one point in a truck, a six-year-old girl, you know, cramped, tight, squalid conditions, really, really just absolutely tragic for her. They made it to the U.S., and then they were separated. And he was eventually deported. And I'll sort of, you know, not not get into too much more of the story um, and, and let you read about it more in the book. But that is the way those three journeys, that like incredible saga that he went through and that he and then his daughter went through is how people ask for asylum. Now. And that is intentional. And what his story elucidates for me and what I'm glad to be talking about today and why I want to go through just some of it is that his tragedy is not only personal, um, but it is precipitated by our politics. So we and, and uh, U.S. politics, to a large degree, are responsible for not only that first crisis, as I mentioned in the very beginning, that, that first you know, situation that drove him out of his home. Um, and we can talk you know, plenty more about that as we go on, but you know, just the, goes way back to the colonial, colonial era subjugation of entire populations to uh, during the Cold War, the U.S. using Central America basically as a military laboratory to ongoing economic discrimination, um, to put it lightly, uh, incarceration and deportation policies um, do that, that spawn the gangs and, 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 you know, on and on about the situation that drove them away. And then we're obviously responsible uh, for denying him the new home, the, the, the security that he sought. So what I think happens to him is, is he, as I said, becomes something like de facto stateless. stateless. He has no state at all to uh, protect him, to find uh, any home in. And so what I am calling for, and I, I think that I, I try to do in my book, though not exactly explicitly, is this urgent need not only to uh, be incensed at his situation, but to act or to take action. And one immediate step, and I, I'm going to wrap up with this, is not only to start taking people into our homes, to opening up our communities, to engaging in what some have called the prophetic tradition of the United States, that is the practice of sanctuary, uh, which goes back to the 19th century Underground Railroad and the 1980s sanctuary movement, then to the new sanctuary movement, to developing homes and communities that can receive people and try to protect them, but then to pushing our politics and to building political power that can actually not only curtail those crises, but as we are doing that, reinstitute reinstitute the, the, the policies of asylum and refugee uh, protocols that we need to protect the people meanwhile. Um, so that, in, in sum, is, is the, the, the scope of my book. And I think from there, I'm, I'm really excited to hear um, Justin talk about more about the current politics and, and how we try to enact some of those uh, protections and, and build up political power. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, that was a uh, fascinating history, and I appreciate the way you uh, sort of brought us through that experience through the storytelling component. Um, really um, make sure that we center the human experience in this in this process. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, ICE, and uh, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And I wanted to talk to you about uh, this, uh, this issue of uh, what abolition means. How do we abolish ICE? And I've been writing about this for a few years and in No One is Illegal, I, uh, in, in the new edition, especially in the later chapters, I talk about uh, the development of ICE. And so I wanna share a little bit about uh, an, uh, my analysis of ICE uh, to try to add some elements into the understanding of, of why it exists and what it'll take to ne negate its existence. Uh, so ICE is, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement is, um, you know, one way of understanding it, it, it's the central pillar of 
what I refer to as the migra state, uh, the, the growing complex of migrant repressive apparatuses that uh, have developed significantly just over the last three decades in, uh, in particular. So not just ICE, but uh, the expansion of the border patrol, the, the expansion of the physical wall uh, and its military accoutrements, uh, militarized accoutrements, the array of checkpoints and databases, detention centers, makeshift camps, um, and of course the police, the local police who have become increasingly uh, integrated into immigration enforcement. So this Migra state um, uh, has been underwritten and nurtured by both political parties in the United States and executed, its, its birth and development and growth has been, have been executed by both parties, um, you know, uh, by the state, regardless of which party is in power. Uh, and in fact, they work, they have worked sort of together. Um, and I, I think this represents the instrumental role of ICE and, and immigration enforcement within the actual functioning of capitalism. So the U.S. state has created, in regards to the immigration enforcement, uh, it has created um, these unequal economies for capital and migrant labor um, and created two different social realities, starkly different social realities uh, for what are referred to as citizens versus uh, people who cross borders. And so I want to illustrate some aspects of ICE and how it's become the lead instrument of legalized violence, um, policing the boundaries between these two domains. So ICE, ICE was born out of war. Um, a war against immigrants. Um, within the boundaries of the United States, ICE was developed uh, in the, under the emergency conditions of post 9-11. Um, it was brought into existence in 2003 and it functions, uh, I would argue, akin to like an occupying force during a war, policing migrant, immigrant and refugee populations, detaining and deporting them. Uh, so during the war on terror, uh, as I mentioned, this quote unquote war on terror, um, and ICE being created, uh, created out of that, it was born with a qualitatively different manner than other enforcement uh, agencies. It is a special body of repressors created to, to fight as if we're at war. Um, and it's, it was elaborated through national security doctrine. Um, this, kind of war footing in which in which ICE was created has been made permanent um, and deployed has been now deployed against general populations of people uh, who are migrants, refugees and, and other people who cross borders. So when I say it's created out of, not, uh, out of uh, national security doctrine, I'm referring specifically to counterinsurgency doctrine. Um, counterinsurgency doctrine is a sort of body of knowledge developed out of uh, U.S. direct participation and support for counterinsurgency movements, uh, especially in Latin America uh, from the 60s to the 80s. Um, and and it, it involves um, sort of policing large populations in which segments of the population are treated as enemy subjects. Um, but it's a low intensity form of conflict um, that isn't necessarily akin to like a a direct war, but one in which um, paramilitary bases are built within and around population centers, um, and they deploy elaborate methods of hunting and extracting people while not upsetting the overall social and economic functions of that society. And so I want to I want to put out there that this gives it its fascist character, um, its capacity to operate outside of external and independent over government oversight. It polices itself. Uh, the fact that its agents have been given operational discretion and are, are are not held to account for violations of human rights, the fact that it openly engages in racial targeting and profiling and uh, virtually um, removed from judicial review. Uh, I want to point out that I don't think this is some kind of dystopian sci-fi uh, sci kind of degeneration of the state. I think it's a manifestation of the substantive changes uh, happening within the capitalist economy and the, and the changing role of the state in that, uh, within that. 
Uh, specifically since the passage of free trade, so quote unquote free trade agreements and the creation of free trade zones and regional economic integration across North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Uh, these have these have basically amounted to the elaboration of sort of transnational capital markets um, in which the U.S. is central um, and dominant. And so I would I put forth the argument that policing has kind of, the policing of migrants has sort of extended uh, out within this larger regional uh, uh, sort of economy created by quote unquote free trade. Um, so I wanna get into that part a little bit more. So a structural analysis of ICE kind of reflects how it's growing in relationship to controlling labor uh, as part of this sort of system of capitalism. And so I wanna give just some, some uh, describe some characteristics of it. And so there are more or less 20,000 ICE agents. There's a There's a, an equal amount of other personnel working under the jurisdiction of ICE, but ICE uh, field agents that operate out of what are referred to as, uh, out of 24, what are referred to as uh, enforcement and removal operation field offices. Um, furthermore, so in other words, ICE um, under Bush uh, extended to Obama and continued under Trump, ICE has taken on this sort of national uh, character operating um, in, in every state. And then it further operates through what are called uh, fusion centers. There's about 80 of these uh, across U.S. states and territories where they collaborate with other federal agents, ICE, uh, excuse me, uh, other agencies like Border Patrol, uh, state police, et cetera, and private contractors. So I'm going I'm to talk about this in a minute, but ICE um, really is a kind of like laboratory for the privatization of repression um, and the money-making aspect of, of that privatization. Um, it's really uh, uh, extraordinary in terms of how, how this has developed. Um, but also ICE operates internationally um, and it has extended out uh, reflecting uh, the way capital has globalized, especially um, we see it uh, operating um, alongside and within this sort of regionalized capitalist economy created through free trade agreements. So ICE operations um, exist all along the, the global nodes of migration and transportation with uh, 78 overseas offices in more than 52 countries. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's expanding um, and, and uh, it, the functions of it continue to grow. So putting this in the context of this capitalist system, I wanna, I wanna try to bring these parts together by saying that uh, this kind of bordered capitalism refers to the development of an architecture of capitalism that is structured, that has been structured into existence over this period, the last three decades, the elaboration of a system of capital mobility that basically has transcended borders uh, through, um, multinational corporations uh, through the construction of regionally integrated transnational production chains from you know, Detroit to Matamoros uh, to Tegucigalpa uh, in Central America. Uh, it refers to financial investments across this region. Um, you know, uh, so, so bordered capitalism is free markets for capital mobility and, and profits. And, a restricted, constrained, and regulated uh, region for uh, labor, for for and refugees and other people, um, you know, on the move. So, so ICE fits into this sort of larger scheme of regulating this labor specifically for the purpose of in creating the means to exploit it, whether it be in sweatshops in Honduras, in Mexico, in Haiti. Or and or uh, amongst migrant workers who cross into the United States, and so the the goal here, or I should say, the outcome of this process has been the creation of a transnationally disenfranchised labor force. So 
I'll just say a few more things about ICE's uh, ICE. It has it has been developed and it has evolved uh, at each phase of its expansion, incorporating new functions into its purview. Um, so, for instance, uh, ICE was created in 2003, and in the context of the period right after 9/11 and the U.S. Uh, invasion of Afghanistan and then Iraq, uh, ICE, ICE's first objective uh, was policing, hunting, deporting, and arresting Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern people, uh, and others, uh, specifically between the years of 2003 and 2006. But after the, the mass protests for e immigrant legalization in 2006, ICE agents were then turned loose on uh, the, the immigrant population in general in this country. Uh, specifically uh, the immigrant working class. So after 2006, for over a year, ICE was at the forefront of hundreds of raids into workplaces across the country. 7, 000, several thousand undocumented workers were arrested and deported. Um, and so this, this idea of moving ICE into the workplaces in the aftermath of, of a mass movement uh, that included worker strikes and worker organizing and unionization and, and, and you know, uh, union support and attempts to organize unions, we see ICE becoming uh, a more, more clearly uh, its function as, a, as the control of labor, uh, it's specifically immigrant labor. This function um, was also, you know, on display last, uh, last November 2019 when um, ICE raids were conducted at poultry plants uh, across small towns uh, in Mississippi. Um, 680 were arrested in total. And this targeting of this chain of poultry plants um, uh, was a few years after these workers won a union facilitated lawsuit against rampant workplace violations that had been common uh, in these uh, meat, pack, in meat pr production facilities. So we see a correlation also between uh, not just the targeting of immigrant workers, uh, but specifically that includes specifically the targeting of workplaces where, work, where immigrant workers have been organizing. So um, I also, you know, wanted to bring up, maybe I'll talk about it more in our discussion, but there's, there's a secondary uh, kind of growth industry that has come out of ICE, and that's... Um, you know, uh, the detention uh, industry. And, you know, you touched on it uh, in your presentation. We see that this has grown into a, a very significant part of the repressive apparatus in the United States in which um, ICE has largely contracted out uh, up to 70% of U.S. immigration de detention capacity to primarily two major corporations, uh, the GEO Group and Core Civic. Um, and where I live in in the, the southern part of San Diego County, uh, we have a very large core civic run immigration detention center. Um, and there's over 600 uh, people housed or detained there. Um, and it also has uh, 200 people infected with COVID-19 because, because the ICE officials um, and the core civic uh, corporation do not want to release uh, uh, you know, the people who have been detained because their profit margins are dependent on keeping these contracts going, keeping the, these uh, people in the detention centers uh, because they're, they're so profitable. That's how, that's how they, they reap their profits. So, um, so we can talk more about that. Um, but just to conclude that uh, on that part, that ICE is bec uh, immigration enforcement in general, the Migra state is becoming a massive massively funded enterprise in which we see uh, it, it's, it's a vehicle also for moving public funds into private sector hands and finance capital. There's a lot of investments in not just detention, but we see a number of industries, including information technology. We see the big tech uh, corporations um, competing for con you know, control over who gets to house ICE's data. Uh, and I also want to point out, and maybe we can talk about this more, that ICE itself, um, the, Department, the Department of Homeland Security overall, and ICE specifically, the leadership are increasingly reflective of this public-private partnership in which 
for instance, the last two, the current and, and previous uh, directors of ICE, uh, excuse me, of Department of Homeland Security, the, the acting directors appointed by Trump, came come out of uh, come out of lobbying firms who um, advocated for contracts, uh, you know, with the Department of Homeland Security for migrant repression. Um, you know, so for instance, uh, the the current the current uh, acting uh, director of Department of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, uh, prior to becoming who he is today, was a uh, he worked at a lobbying firm called Wexler and Walker, and uh, he specialized. Chad Wolf specialized in uh, working in the defense, homeland security, and transportation sectors, um, advocating for government contracts for these sectors. So he goes from one side of the equation, the private sector, to then becoming uh, the acting uh, head of the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, so. Uh, you know, I, I was compiling a list and you can go through almost every head of, you know, uh, the DHS and the, uh, and the ICE going back several years and find that they either began in the private sector or after they re retired or stepped down, they moved directly into the, into the uh, private sector, um, uh, you know, as lobbyists or, you know, uh, uh, members of the board of different um you know, one even went into Geo Group, the, one of the detention. So uh, there's a lot to, to talk about there. But in conclusion, I wanted to um, I wanted to say that you know there there's been uh, the elaboration of this kind of abolish ICE movement over the last few years, and um, you know I think it, it's it's a Twitter hashtag, but it really reflects mass protests that have been um, pushing uh, towards uh, you know not just legalization for for immigrants, um, but also pushing back against this uh, migra state. So, for instance, in um, you know we saw the mass protests in 2006 against criminalization of immigrants. We've seen May Day protests every year, taking up demands uh, that include abolish ICE. We saw the Occupy ICE protests uh, a few years ago, um, which around the country people were going and trying to disrupt the. Uh, the operations of, of ICE and detaining and, de and deporting people. And we've seen hundreds of other kind of quantitative actions that have shaped out the slogan of, of abolish ICE. Um, and I think it's important because it, it represents a kind of step forward, but there are limitations to how it has been represented so far. Um, you know, during the last presidential election cycle, Kirsten Gillibrand, who was running for the Democratic Party, New York Senator, proposed uh, you know, supported abolish ICE, but in her case, it was uh, basically just to move ICE out of the Department of Homeland Security. Bernie Sanders wanted to get rid of ICE as an agency, but to retain and redistribute its functions to other agencies. Elizabeth Warren pledged to remake the Border Patrol and ICE with better values. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, has emphasized the need to abolish ICE, that it can't be reformed, but, but hasn't publicly stated how that could happen. Um, Joe Biden, who is now the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party, actually is nowhere near abolish ICE and wants to return um, wants to return the the media state to to what he believes how it functioned better under Obama and you know uh, return to the sort of Clinton Obama Democratic approach to maintaining the border and expanding ICE and uh, but doing it without the extreme the extreme um, sort of methods of of Donald Trump uh, ICE. Abolish ICE has to be more than a slogan. It has to be a, prospe a process for actually not just not just getting rid of the agency, but also getting rid of the functions of immigrant repression altogether. And that's a very big challenge, and that's a task that I'd like to discuss more uh, uh, because I have you know some ideas how what I think it will take. Um, and I think that the, this discussion you know needs to continue, and we need to. Uh, sort of revive this this argument that we have to um, not just um, oppose ICE, but we have to begin to envision a world without it and without the migrant repressive state altogether. I, on, on that exact note, um, when I've talked about uh, 
abolition movements before. I, I think it's important to emphasize whether it's abolishing prisons or abolishing ICE or the borders. It's not just a negative approach. It's very much a positive visioning of a more just society. I think that's critical to remember that uh, we don't just need to uh, push back, but we need to push forward very much. Um, one of the things uh, I'm curious to hear you talk more about um, is, you know, you, you, you reference um, that ICE is a, well, I guess before I go there, I, I, I also just would like to emphasize that, you know, abolish ICE is a great slogan. It sounds good. It's got like civil in it. it. It just, it's like a good, cool, scary word that you can like easily attack. Um, but of course, like we need to abolish more than that. Like abolishing the Migra state doesn't quite have the same ring, but that's like really what you're going for. Abolishing borders um, is really scary to a lot of people. I don't think it should be, um, but I think that really is the, is, is putting it on the track of that positive visioning rather than just a negative, um, like combative movement. And I think that's important to emphasize. Um, but I like abolish Migra state as well. I think that, that could work. Um, so you, you talked about ICE being a fascistic institution. Um, I wonder the importance of its own representation a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think of, and this is not at all to minimize the very real, deadly, sometimes, um, often, effects that the ICE agency has. I mean, locking up 30,000 people now, uh, 200 plus people in, in Otay Mesa, um, you know, all, all the, just the, the, the violence that it uh, wields. But also it's important, I think, we see this politically to just kind of posture or signal um, that they have more power than they do. I think of a couple of examples here. One is um, Operation Endgame, which was a, I think it started in 2003. It was an ICE strategy with the intention of arresting and deporting all people who didn't have documents in the United States, which at the time, anyone with any knowledge of the situation knew that that was just completely unfeasible. And it would be for the foreseeable future. It still is unfeasible, though Trump has, without you know, knowing his history or knowing that that strategy has called for the same thing a couple times. And, you know, what is the importance of just like posturing that they can do that? And there's there's all these other sorts of examples like, you know, they can't even come close, like 20,000 people, 20,000 agents, you know, many of whom are focused on different things rather than just arresting people couldn't couldn't possibly arrest the, you know, 10 plus million people who don't have documentation to be in the United States. And yet they have this image of themselves and they, I think, uh, promote this image of themselves um, as a, a very real uh, organization that does have more capacity than it does. Do you think that that is part of the importance? And do you think that maybe abolishing ICE or the movement behind doing such a thing can sort of not only, I mean, because I, I, I struggle sometimes when people say like, well, well, what does abolish, me, uh, abolish ICE mean to you? Like, what do we actually do? How do we do it? You know, I, I don't have a real clear answer, but I think the way that we talk about ICE is like, look, like they, you know, we need to take and, and promote and posture our own community power, not just submit to this scary menace. Um, and there, there's so many other examples there where ICE, or and not just ICE, but um, I think like the other organizations that they are affiliated with, Border Patrol or DHS, and some of the, the, the work that they do abroad also make that same sort of, um, do that same sort of signaling or, or posturing as this like really powerful, intense agency. So like, how do we combat just the messaging? Or, or do you think that that's an important aspect here? Yeah, I, I, very good points. I I think um, I agree that uh, the push towards mass transportation was blunted, um, but I think the 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 the, sur the surge of the far right, especially. Um, you know, in 2005, 2006, around the time that the, you know, the Republican Party uh, was pushing 
the the Sensenbrenner Brenner uh, King bill, which would have made it a felony to be undocumented. We saw, you know, we saw that coming out of James Sensenbrenner was a congressman from uh, Wisconsin, one of the richest districts in, in the United States, uh, a billionaire coming from a sort of billionaire background, um, pushing this idea of criminalizing immigrants, um, m- you know, making it a felony. We saw the surge of far, you know, farther right and far right groups that uh, were able to sort of push forward mass deportation. I don't think the, you know, the the capitalist class in this country has ever wanted genuine mass deportation. Or at least the history shows that um, deportation has always been episodic and focusing on, um, you know, sort of targeting populations around the, the margins of the, of the larger subject population um, as a way to, um, you know, uh, control, repress, intimidate, subjugate. And so I think like the evolution of that uh, process of, you know, started as mass deportation, we actually saw a sort of battle in the Republican Party, uh, especially between 2008 and 2010, in which the business wing began to the corporate wing began to push back against um, against you know the far right, um, and we see the elaboration of this idea of enforcement through attrition, which is really the the sort of governing doctrine of both political parties. Um, this emerges out out of um, a far right think tank um, that elaborates the idea that uh, we 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 have to sort of degrade the living conditions of of immigrants to a point where theoretically, that they don't want to live here anymore, right? So in 2012, when Obama, uh, the uh, the re-election campaign, he competed, you know, he was running against Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney actually sort of led with this, that we have to, we have to get self-deportation as the guiding. Well, it already was in place. I mean, that was already happening under Obama, and that, uh, that enforcement through attrition, I think, is is, you know, uh, has become standardized and normalized in which, um, you know, and, and sort of embraced and, you know, and, and, and is the sort of functioning doctrine, um, uh, you know, that we see today. But the question of, like, uh, his role within that, I mean, I think ICE is, is interesting because it's, as I was saying in, in my earlier presentation, there's been this kind of, you know, the way it was created, it doesn't really have a, a clear defining sort of reason for existence it, it's it's morphed it, and it continues to evolve them and prior you know last year there was some revelations some leaked documents about ice uh, building infrastructure in the united states in which their mission would would extend from immigration enforcement now to crowd control gang suppression so we see this mission creep and i and i think this is kind of what I'm getting at when I say that it's it's fascistic in nature because it it kind of operates off the grid of traditional law enforcement and and it becomes very politicized under under Trump. Um, you know, uh, we've seen not the the sort of putting in place of far right ideologues, but the but the promotion from within of people. You know the. These in, these these uh, institutions like the Department of Homeland Security and its component parts they have also political cultures within them. They have a, a kind of you know if you want to put it in, st- in stark terms Democratic Party affiliated or leaning and re- and right right wing and Republican Party leaning um, sort of personalities and um, and then you know within ICE itself you have like really far right sort of ideologues within there. And so like, uh, uh, I'm forgetting his name, but uh, Thomas Homan, the one who was uh, appointed by, he was he came up through the ranks through Obama and he was appointed by Trump um, to carry out, uh, you know, uh, the policies of, you know, this, the, the worst aspects of what has been happening in immigration enforcement. He sort of made a name for himself within that sort of, environment of the uh, of ice by taking kind of positions against the flora settlement by 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 calling for restrictions on refugees and limiting the tra- uh, the trafficking victim trafficking victims protection act and, and others so 
So it isn't that Trump, you know, sort of represents this new, you know, sort of entourage of people. It's it's a, a qualitatively more violent uh, manifestation of this system in the form of Trump getting getting in control and sort of elevating these elements uh, through his you know through his government um, and, and, and and promoting them into power, which in which we see the qualitative you know, it get more qualitatively worse in terms of the, the scale of violence and degradation. And then lastly, the, you know, I, I would just say, and this is controversial, is we need, we need to call for open borders um, because that is, the, that is the, the noose that sits on any kind of movement for immigrant rights in this country. That, that is the choke point in which uh, if we don't have an answer for what that means, then people you know, people are silenced and the narrative stays stays dominant that we have to control our borders. I mean, we saw this with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was pushed into a corner around this question and he 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 couldn't come to terms with the, with with what what the implications of him saying we need to keep control our borders was and he you know, I think he allowed the right to has allowed the right to continue to shape that narrative. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to jump in um, about Thomas Homan for a second, that he was also the one which I can't remember exactly how he put it, but he said that if you don't have papers to be in the United States, you should be looking over your shoulder. And you should be scared of ICE. And that sort of goes back to, I, I forgot that when I was asking my question, but it sort of goes back to the what I was trying to get at in the question is that, you know, they can't, like, 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 they can't be targeting every undocumented person, but they say things like that to try to build this culture of fear. And I think that there's an opening there. The, the, between the inability to actually affect a policy like that and the invocation of that fear, there's a gap where I think um, we can build political power, we can build community power and say, like, no, you shouldn't be scared because we will protect you. We will open our homes. We're going to, you know, have ice out of community efforts. We're not going to let ice into our stores, our hospitals, anything. And that is, I think, where we need to push back, not only against ice itself, but against the narrative, um, which is sort of what I was trying to articulate in, in that first question. Um, I, I had another question for you, Justin. Um, you know, it's, it's great to talk to you so I can kind of pick your brain here. But um, one of the things that you elucidate in your book, um, known as Illegal very well, is, is and you've mentioned a couple of times in this conversation, is, uh, well, not just the mass movements of um, like immigrant rights movements that we saw in 2006 and, and a couple other times um, in reaction to the Muslim ban more recently and, and, and elsewhere. But you call for, and you, you, you discuss the history of labor movements and, and the need for international solidarity, international connection between the labor movements. And I wonder how that applies to not just labor, to not just restrict it to a conversation about labor, but about a, a, a movement for immigrant rights that isn't just on this side of the border. So if we're going to have open borders and we're going to try to connect um, movements of labor, we also have to connect sort of like the resistance of uh, towards ice, which is abroad. Um, do you know of movements or abolish ice movements um, outside of the U.S. and and how do we connect to them? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I don't know anything specific about abolish ice beyond the borders, but I do know that. Um, or more generally, you know, uh, anti-borders or uh, open borders movements. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, this this is an interesting question. I mean, it, it there are variations in terms of different countries. I, I would say how it's the how how it's in relationship to the United States and its border and the role of U.S. Uh, the role of the U.S. specifically through the various means of imperialism in which borders amplify the problems in their own society. So, um, you know, a lot of people get deported from the United States. And uh, right now, specifically, uh, people, the U.S. is deporting people with COVID-19 back to Central America, uh, to Mexico, to Haiti. You know, so when, when we talk about 
how people view the U.S. and its border, you know, I, I think there's a lot of instances where the understanding of the function of the border um, is not in their interest and does not help them, especially people crossing borders, of course. Uh, but I, I, I think there's another way of kind of looking at um, international solidarity, you know, more more recently, um, and that's in the, the context of what you brought up, which is labor struggle and how labor struggle itself is transcending the border. Um, and this was something that I was bringing up in earlier in my presentation when I talked about um, capitalism doesn't have any borders. U.S. capitalism doesn't have any borders. Um, specifically in the context of the Western Hemisphere, um, you know, but also through international institutions that the U.S. heavily influences or controls, like the International Monetary Fund, um, you know, um, and, and other international institutions. But, but looking at uh, North America, for instance, um, most uh, major U.S. corporations have extended operations beyond borders. Um, if you buy a car in the United States that was uh, finished in Chattanooga or Detroit, uh, components of that car are gonna are gonna have been produced in Tamaulipas, Mexico, or in um, you know uh, somewhere in, in that country. Uh, so we have these uh, supply chain. You know, this is one of the features of this sort of global. You know, of this sort of these free trade models that give capital free reign is they've moved capital, they've exported capital, and they've established, you know, uh, this sort of uh, segmented production or supply pr uh, supply chain production. And um, we also see that in agriculture, right? So um, I live in San Diego, and uh, about three hours south of me is one of the largest agricultural export, industrial export zones in North America, it's in the, the Valley of San Quintin in Baja California. And um, and if you go, well, let me let me say that that in 2015 there was a there was a strike there um, in the Valley of San Quintin, uh, where over 30,000 workers went on strike. Now this is an interesting phenomenon because many of those workers are migrant workers from southern Mexico. Many are indigenous. Um, and they migrate to Baja California into this valley during berry season specifically. Well, much of the grower infrastructure there is either directly owned by U.S. multinational corporations or U.S. multinational corporations like Driscoll's Berries buys those berries. Um, and so when they went on strike in 2015 um, for union rights. Uh, but and they're also part of a migration corridor that extends all the way up to the Pacific Northwest. And right now there's a strike happening in uh, the Yak Yakima County in Washington state that, that is like several of these, uh, the, you know, also agricultural export zones um, in which they ship out apples. Um, they produce um, in Yakima County, like 70% of the US, US, uh, US apples consumed in the US, but they also ship them internationally. So there's a, there's several of these uh, company uh, workers who are on strike at several of these companies, and I'm in the process of sort of charting this this series of strikes that have spread from 2015 to today uh, it, through this agricultural corridor of migrant workers, um, and you know so to me this this is an example of a transnational labor movement um, that explicitly. Well, implicitly and potentially explicitly is, you know, a, a movement against borders <laughs> because the tendency is that um, if you're organizing across borders, there's an inclination to equalize wages, right? So if you, so if you're working in San Quintin, you want to, you know, you want to, you want to get paid what the workers doing similar things are in San Diego County or in Yakima, Yakima County. Uh, and uh, this is also happening in auto. So I mentioned briefly the auto industry. There's been strikes in maquiladoras uh, who are producing parts for cars. There was a GM strike last year that shut down a lot of auto production facilities in the in, in the United States. So there's these there's the makings of sort of coordinated transnational labor struggle, which 
which you know ultimately would basically would say that we we need to be in the same unions we need to be we want to make the same pay we want to make the same wages uh and this is the context for the, the reason why borders are being reinforced this is the context for why ice is uh unleashed in the you know um in my opinion because there can't be this kind of solidarity across borders um so th that's how i i see um in many ways, the impetus for abolishing ICE is coming from not from people in necessarily in the U not from U.S. citizens necessarily, but from migrant workers. Uh, but be attaining citizenship, the citizenship is part of that struggle. Uh, but I think we could do more, and I, and I think that that's the future of of building a movement for open borders. And just to conclude with this point, I say it a lot: is that borders and immigration and, and and enforcement really only exists for one segment of the population, and that's the the working, the working class, the transnational working class. I mean, what what would happen if you move the the U.S. Mexico border thirty miles south, and all the maquiladoras that are just in northern Mexico there, all of a sudden had the same safety regulations, the same minimum wage standards as you had in the United States? I mean, it would be uh, it, it'd be a, a such a upheaval in those industries. I mean, the, the maquiladoras work hand in glove with the, the corporate manufacturing centers in Detroit or elsewhere. And yeah. really, without that border, they would have to raise costs or they would have to um, decrease profits. So like, you know, one of the things I often will say is that, you know, the border is not a sort of a, a, a happenstance along that along that divide right there, but it is creating a divide. It's, it's the one that is, it, it is what is creating the wage differences or the safety standard differences. It's without the border, you would not be able to affect those. You'd not be able to like engage in that exploitation. Exactly. So in the interest of time, should we hop into some audience questions? Um, before I bring in some of these audience questions, I want to remind you that Verso and Haymarket have a great roster event, of events coming up. Um, people will post sign-up links in the chat. Thank you so much for your interest and support and for helping radical ideas thrive in a time where they're so needed. Um, so, a couple of, some, some really good ones here. How do we reconcile a call for open borders with the need for decolonization to repatriate indigenous land? Justin, do you have initial thoughts on that one? You're muted. Yeah, I was I was busy writing it down. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, how do we reconcile a call for open borders with the need for decolonization and to repatriate indigenous land? Hmm. That's a great question. <clears throat> Uh, well, I mean, uh, off the top of my head, uh, I mean, this is this is a very fundamental aspect of open borders. I mean, border the border themselves, the U.S. Bex uh, Mexico border wall is a destructive uh, sort of occupying force in and of itself on indigenous lands as they exist today, uh, cutting through and dividing at least 12 um, indigenous nations um, along the U.S.-Mexican border. So I think I think uh, abolishing the border, or 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 you know, the fight for open borders has to start with what exists now and say that the border is is a destructive and occupying force for indigenous communities today, and that those indigenous communities should uh, be able to to retain the integrity of their lands. Um, I think it's also integrated with to, into what's happening in southern Mexico because um, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and its modern, it, it, excuse me, it's, it's, its updated version in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement has been devastating uh, for indigenous lands um, in, within Mexico, um, which ba basically uh, you saw as part of this uh, negotiated agreement um, in which the United States uh, sort of 
it's a longer discussion, but imposed uh, NAFTA onto the, the Mexican pop the Mexican pop uh, government and population. Um, we saw the root the the Mexican state um, in compliance with NAFTA obliterated um, what are called the hidos, which um, are communal lands across the country uh, that still existed, you know, in many parts of Me Mexico uh, prior to the signing of NAFTA. Uh, that's the context for the Zapatista uprising, right? Um, was the defense of land um, in opposition to the free trade agreement. So I think there's kind of like immediate, there's immediate and existing um, destructive effects uh, in, in terms of right now. And then beyond that, um, we have to, Organize, organize in solidarity uh, to further elaborate what that means. Um, but I agree with the idea that, um, you know, there are layers, uh, you know, in terms of how capitalism, you know, in its current form has been destructive, um, you know, to indigenous uh, populations throughout this region. And so we would, you know, we, we would have to build out a model, a larger model, but I think the starting point would be to uh, restore the lands, um, you know, that have been, that are, have been and are still currently under threat uh, by the border enforcement regimes and the free trade agreements. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I would just add that, you know, we can't decouple the call for open borders with a much greater call for justice, for a, a, a variety of issues, including indigenous rights. Um, right now, the border is an incredibly destructive force on indigenous land, um, off of indigenous land, uh, wh wherever it, it, it draws this line. And to uh, stop that violence, I think, is, is, a, is a priority. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can't do so responsibly and be led by the people who are it, it's most affecting and, um, and and listen to, you know, how we're going to better organize. Um, but certainly this type of organization, I don't think has been good for for anyone, including indigenous folks. Absolutely. Um, to marry a handful of questions that are sort of tied together, how is the migra state changing under the coronavirus? Um, has the crisis impacting migration and asylum seekers? And how can we sort of stand in solidarity with undocumented communities in the midst of the crisis? Um, I have a sort of a, a, a initial response, Justin, if I could jump in first. Um, you know, one example that we're seeing today, global example that we're seeing today is uh, Portugal who at the beginning of the pandemic gave temporary uh, only, but at least temporary citizenship rights to all undocumented people, asylum seekers and refugees in Portugal. And that was so that they could access healthcare. And that's not happening in the United States, uh, to the surprise of no one. Uh, I know I, I did a, a piece for the nation a few weeks ago about the very real fear that uh, immigrant, not only undocumented, but including undocumented and immigrant communities feel in New York, in different parts of New York, um, about accessing care. And then, as you know, we both mentioned, the today, increasingly, uh, the people who are detained in ICE detention centers are asylum seekers. Um, the situation in a number of parts of the world, I, I mentioned the, the man I spoke to today from Haiti, um, or from lots of people from Central America or parts of Africa who are in the detention centers are asylum seekers and they are um, at very serious risk um, of contracting the virus if they don't already have it. And then our insistence on denying, not only denying people, but then deporting them afterwards, those that rep, uh, asylum status is spreading the virus. So it's not only that we're not protecting <coughs> those people or protecting ourselves, we're actually proliferating the pandemic right now by our immigration and asylum policies. Yeah, those are good points. I would just add that, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the infrastructure of the Migra state can only operate one way, um, and that's to increase repression. I mean, it, it, it's, it is not a neutral, 
you know, there, it isn't politically neutral or guided by a moral compass. It is, it is, it is in the hands of whoever it operates through who controls, who controls it, who runs the state. Um, and under the pandemic, you know, we saw this as an opportunity for Trump to increase the Trump administration to increase repression. And so in March, uh, the administration announced that it was going to deploy more ICE agents into sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. Um, we've seen, uh, although there has been the, the demobilization of, de of some sort of deportation, uh, you know, the, of the sort of mechanics of deportation, we've still seen uh, deportations taking place. Over several thousand people have been deported since since March. Uh, we've seen that the, the Trump administration, and, and keep in mind that uh, this has this has warranted very little opposition from from the Democratic Party. It has factored very very little into the actual. Um, you know, the discourse of politics in this country uh, in terms of opposition to it. Uh, but I, what I was going to add was we, we saw Trump um, develop out, you know, uh, some initial bailouts that were, you know, uh, the largest handouts to the to corporations and, and, and capitalist investors in world history. Um, and the, the, by, by comparison, the minuscule, um, uh, components that um, you know provided, like the checks, the one-time checks, the uh, the increasing um, unemployment benefits, you know, things that are people need, but not nearly enough. Uh, Trump administration was careful to to write into every aspect that this the, that these benefits cannot be extended to undocumented people. So it definitely counters to the model that was that was presented by John in, Port in Portugal. Um, but I would also um, I would also add that like uh, it's going beyond that because Trump if you if you go back to 2016 you know Trump Trump's there's many faces to a political campaign but the public face of Trump's campaign was against immigration and um, you know and the vile and racist and xenophobic rhetoric that were that were part of his his campaign. Um, once, once an office sort of translated into a series of pet projects to, to be cruel and, in, and for, to further, you know, create cruel and inhumane um, punishments for undocumented people. Well, we're heading into another election cycle, and um, we already see the Trump administration positioning itself to be, um, to 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 use immigration as an election issue, specifically around COVID nineteen, because. Um, the reality of the of the way the pandemic played out is that um, it's all indicators show that the 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 infection rate extended from the United States into Mexico into the border the border states because there's a lot of cross border movement and there's like 200,000 U.S. citizens that live in the border states um, of Mexico and they cross back and forth. There's there's you know so but but the point is is that the indicators show that the rate of infection increased more rapidly in Mexico and the border states, which would indicate that since the United States, the rate of infection happened, increased more rapidly here, and and this became the epicenter before we see the increase in infections in Mexico's border states that that it started here. But Trump, Trump is is beginning to uh, manipulate. The, he's going to continue to do this, but he's already beginning to manipulate the narrative that we're gonna have to protect ourselves from migrants crossing the border with COVID-19 in the months to come. And just last week he sent his, uh, the head of DHS came to San Diego, Chad Wolf came and said that, you know, they're gonna be doing, a, that he was doing a tour of the border to consult with, um, you know, people in the region about how to begin to protect against an, a wave of COVID-19 infections crossing the border from Mexico. So. So this is, you know, this is how the media state functions. And I'll just, I'll just conclude though by, by saying that it's contradictory because, you know, capital wants immigrant workers, you know, uh, to, and immigrant workers have become a significant portion of the, of the workforce in this country. It wants workers without rights, and the Trump administration, the previous administrations have, you know, 
provided that or you know have worked to provide that but the the pandemic has also exposed what many of us already know which is these workers uh, perform very essential functions in our society. They, you know, they, and, in terms of the occupations that they have, and so, um, and so, this is a contradiction, you know, in the, from the point of view of, of sort of public opinion, um, where Trump is, you know, going to further criminalize or, or further demonize, at the same time that people recognize, perhaps for the first time, that their lives are dependent on people, um, you know, on, on the labor of people. From a political standpoint. Um, you know, and in, in terms of analyzing the significance of this, I think we, we see that workers, uh, especially immigrant workers, um, you know, in these important sectors of the economy are, have power and, you know, and, and they have the capacity to use that power um, to, you know, to organize, to defend themselves, uh, to fight, you know, for immediate demands around protective equipment, like what, what we see in happening in Washington state and, and to be, have the same essential wage increases, essential worker wage increases that others have. But I, I just also want to remind uh, people that immigrant workers have built the labor movement in this country uh, from the beginning. And, and the, the, the current wave, um, if we go back to the last few decades, we've seen that the immigrant workers have been at the forefront of, of organizing, of union organization. Um, and out of that, you know, um, we saw... 2006, you know, the, the, the political demand for legalization. So I, so I think this contradiction, you know, has all these negative aspects, but it also shows the potential power uh, of, of immigrant workers in, solid, you know, in alliance with uh, the rest of the working class to, um, you know, to, to sort of make demands that include the political demand for legalization to counter the, the narrative, uh, you know, the the uh, the narrative of, of Trumpism and the idea of of uh, the fact that, or the idea that immigrants are, are any kind of threat to our society, I think that's going to be crucial. But it has to also has to be organized, and the immigrant workers are already showing the way for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just chime in really quick to mention uh, you you referenced the fact that Democrats aren't pushing back against uh, various Trump orders to lock down the border, to uh, also cancel asylum. Uh, policies, I think that is really critical to just bring up and just remember that as far as I know, like there's the CDC order that uh, instituted uh, Operation Capio, which is the reason, the, the, the justification for pushing people back from the border, even if they're asking for asylum, even if they're minors, um, that there hasn't even been legal challenges to it yet. Um, you know, I, I haven't checked in the last couple of days, so I could be wrong. There could have been something that just came up. But not only is there not a political challenge to it, a, 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 a clear political challenge to it, but there isn't a legal challenge. And I think that really highlights for me that we can't rely on, well, one, the Democratic Party or things that happen for us. Like We need to push back against these policies. Um, they are incredibly dangerous, not only for the people they most directly affect, but for everyone. I mean, especially in, in, in the days of a of a highly contagious pandemic. What are your thoughts on the externalization of U.S. enforcement and the expansion of the U.S. border itself, you know, where enforcement now starts at the Guatemala-Mexico border? Uh, I, I have a couple quick thoughts on that, too. Um, it, it, it certainly starts even beyond that. I mean, I, I can't remember the number of countries that you mentioned Justin, I've heard a number of other people, um, you know, cite how many countries various DHS sub-agencies are currently in. Todd Miller does terrific work on this, another Verso book, Empire Borders. Um, I covered for the nation the um, the establishment of Salvador, El Salvador's Border Patrol last fall, which nobody's trying to get into El Salvador right now to, to move. I mean, there are very, very few people um, maybe from Nicaragua or thing and, and looking to get into El Salvador. But there's really no legitimate reason. This goes back to my first question to you is this idea of, of both posturing control and power and then, um, you know, using it to wield some sort of influence over other countries. Um, certainly it is effective along the Guatemala-Mexico border and then throughout Mexico. Um, we've established a gauntlet there for people to get through. 
and it's deadly. And, uh, you know, it, it is, I think, another reason why we need to make sure that abolish ICE itself isn't confined by borders or abolish the border isn't just about the U.S.-Mexico border. The, the border extends much further south and we can't limit ourselves to just U.S. politics here, um, you know, nor just U.S. influence, because a lot of it is wrapped up in that, especially in Mexico or in Central America. But, um, you know, if, if you start thinking about Europe, you know, um, Frontex, European Union's borders extend all the way into Africa, all the way, um, you know, beyond the EU into the Balkans as well. So, you know, it, we really need to consider the global context here. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that to you, Justin. Yeah, I, I I wrote an article called the Anti-Migrant International in which I, this is a global phenomenon and, and thanks for pointing out, you know, how it's happening in Europe, but it, it really is a, a global phenomenon, uh, phenomenon. In terms of the, in terms of the U.S., you know, I think, uh, you know, I think a way of understanding this is looking at uh, specifically Mexico, the Caribbean and Central America as as nations that because of the force and power of U.S. capitalism and the way that this muscle has been exercised through these so-called free trade agreements, uh, the way that these have really restructured the economies of, of Mexico, for instance, uh, Honduras, they, they, they in many ways are extensions of the U.S. economy. Um, and so I talk about this in the context of this, you know, this idea of bordered capitalism, the way that we have to rethink the way what borders are, um, because for capital and for, you know, for even much of the population at the center of U.S. capitalism, the U.S. population, there are no borders the way that we that we see them for poor people, for migrants, uh, for people coming from countries that have been economically dominated or historically colonized. So, um, so in Honduras, for instance, um, it's a, you know, compared to the United States, it's a relatively small country. They have a large maquiladora sector uh, because of CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, and the way in which Central American economies have been restructured to serve the larger needs of U.S capitalism um, and the in the interest of U.S. investors, Honduras sends like uh, like 40 plus percent of its exports are clothes that are produced there and then sent and, you know, become part of the fashion market here. Um, you know, so so Central America, especially the three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras, those that have been, you know, those that have right wing <laughs> governments that are, you know, more or less in alignment with, um, with U.S. capital, um, you know, they essentially, uh, they, th that represents um, the extent, you know, the extension of the U.S. economy and the movement of people. So, so we have, we need, there needs to be people contained in Honduras, right? I mean, not that everybody migrates, but but the idea is that you have to segment this labor force. If you have maquiladoras in Honduras producing one, you know, one or two or multiple important commodities that are part of the U.S. supply chain in Mexico, you have uh, thousands of these maquiladoras that produce everything from medical equipment to automobiles, uh, auto, you know, parks, and even old cars. Uh, you know, each country sort of fits into these these uh, into this larger sort of system, um, and so you know, um, extension of U.S. enforcement is to is to it's ideological in the sense that it's part of this process of establishing U.S. dominance over the region, but it's also to work within these nodes of labor containment, controlling migration, and that each stage of this each stage of this sort of bordered capitalist zone, capital, capitalism zone, you know, each, each segment serves, uh, uh, plays a role, serves the, the interests of the larger economic forces that work. I could just, so, give, yeah. sorry, no. I just give one quick concrete example of that, that I, I mentioned just briefly in my book, but I, I spent an afternoon with one young man 
who lived in a basically a slum in San Pedro Sula, in like the, the industrial capital of Honduras. And he his job in a maquiladora was to make NBA jerseys, like the actual official NBA jerseys for the players. And he had tried to, after getting in trouble, or the police really kind of just uh, hounding him, um, he fled to the United States, asked for asylum, was deported. And he wanted to be an engineer. That was his idea. But now he is locked into this slum in Honduras. He very rarely leaves anywhere but the maquila where he works and his home. And he makes 10 some dollars a day. Um, so there you have like a very concrete example of someone who's locked down and exploited by his labor who tried to get out, who tried to cross the border. And, and we, we didn't, we didn't, not only didn't let him, but then we just pushed him back into this highly exploitative, extremely dangerous um, situation that he's stuck in now. So we'll do one last question. Um, how would you combat the narrative that we need borders to keep people safe? Well, I think borders are deadly, and I think we're, there's m mountains of empirical evidence to support this, um, because borders aren't designed to keep us safe. Um, border, you know, border borders in terms of walls and enforcement of the movement of people aren't designed to keep us safe. Um, they're a fairly recent phenomenon, you know, as John was pointing out, um, you know, it's it's a they can be enforced borders can be better understood as a phase of recent history, and and I would argue in a relationship to capitalism and the way in which the exploitation of migrant and transnational workers has become a factor in maintaining the the exploitation and super exploitation of their labor has nothing to do with safety and security but of course it's presented that way um but from the point of view of people from the point of view of of those who live uh within the regime of borders and enforcement and and, and around it um borders equal death um there's been you know uh in this current in this current pandemic crisis a lot of states especially these far-right denialist states like the united states and brazil there's there's a conscious effort to undercount deaths there that you know there, there's a you know uh, a, a tendency to not even want to test right even if you have the resources to do testing there's a tendency to not want to test because uh you know because the reality is is that this is devastating for people and and i, I use that as an example to compare to what's happening at the border People are dying every day, um, you know, spanned out since 1994. If we use that as a starting point for the militarization of the U.S. border, the, the incorporation of walls, military training and equipment and doctrine and, you know, and, and pushing people to cross into a uh, deadly and, and dangerous terrain, there's there's been thousands of people that have died since since the early 90s. Probably between 10 and 15,000 people have perished. The the U.S. government doesn't count them. Um, the Mexican government tries, but many of the deaths are on the U.S. side of the border. Uh, so it's it's left to human rights workers to to try to um, help and support people crossing, um, but also to try to keep track, uh, find the room, you know help deliver the remains to uh you know back to their families etc uh so yeah so this is the reality um the, this is the reality and then you know the way enforcement is evolving it's it's you know it, it's a threat to labor so the border wall represents a a way to divide labor um u.s labor is that it's lowest level of organization uh, in modern history. And uh, in 1986, which was the last time we had an amnesty, last time there was a negotiated amnesty for the legalization of undocumented workers, uh, it led to a surge in the growth of unions that organized immigrant workers and a continued decline of unions that didn't. 
so ever since the legalization of 1986, we've seen um, the growth of labor union labor unionism amongst immigrant workers, the decline of all other unions. Um, this is the context for criminalization of migrant labor is the concern that um, if it is not repressed, if it is if it had, has access to equal rights and citizenship, it will once again um, it will once again join unions or unionize or or revitalize the labor movement. So this is why I con consistently argue that it's not about safety and security, and and in fact it has much more to do with profits and dividing and atomizing the working uh, the working class. Um, so uh, so yeah so. And keep in mind that it's not about stopping the movement of people. I live in the, I live right on the U.S.-Mexico border. I live at the most busy intersection, uh, international intersection in the world, the San Isidro uh, Tijuana crossing. Uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, even under the conditions of repression, there are still hundreds of millions of crossings each year. Um, there are tens of thousands of workers who cross from Mexico into the U.S. to work. There are H hundreds of thousands of crossings of people from the U.S. into Mexico. I mean, it is a very, uh, you know, it, it is for for those who don't live on the border, there can be the there, you can have the the impression that that the the, the wall is a, is a, a true dividing line, but it uh, it isn't, um, except for migrant labor, except for the one percent who are not given the one percent of crossers who are not given the means to legally cross. That is what it boils down to. The wall works against 1% of people who cross. And they also are the people that are currently playing the leading role in feeding people and in, in sustaining important labor in hospitals, uh, in industries across the country. Um, so this is, this is the great contradiction. So this is why we have to say open the border because what we're saying is open the border to labor. We're saying open the border to rebuilding our unions. We're saying open the border for human rights. Um, and as long as we re as long as we continue to believe that the border does anything else, then we co we continue to limit ourselves, and we continue to um, remain subservient to the capitalist system that's you know uh, that's banking on its ability to divide and, and exploit us all. I hardly want to say anything after that, um, but. I mean that that was that was very well put. Thanks, Justin. Um, maybe to put a quick cap on on I guess my, my part of the evening to throw a couple figures there. So you know, a, a, as you state so clearly, the borders do not do what they purport to do. They don't actually stop people. They they do kill people. Um, but people who want to get across often do get across. We don't have exact numbers, but we know that they do. So. The number of people who are killed, like maybe 10,000, maybe more of people we've been able to count, I've been working with or affiliated with No More Deaths for a long time, based out of Arizona. Those are the people we count and we know have died. We know that there are probably 10,000, 20,000 or more people who have been disappeared since then. Internationally, that number in about the last 15 years is about 100,000 that we can count, the number of people who have died while trying to cross an international boundary. That number might be two, three, four times as high, maybe even more. We don't know. So they don't keep us safe. They keep things very dangerous for us. And you have to ask who us is. Of course, that's a much bigger conversation. But the last question I would pose is safe from whom? Like, Who are we protecting anyone from by erecting a border? Um, you know, I, I don't want to get into a spat about one migrant maybe killed someone here. That isn't, it doesn't make any logical sense. You know, you think about the idea of like numeracy, it's so unlikely that anyone is going to be killed in the United States by a, a migrant. Um, but, you know, you sometimes have to appeal to those statistics and those figures when people just revert to this gut instinct that uh, we are unsafe when politicians constantly just throw this at us, that we're, it, it's to protect people, it's to protect our communities. Um, it just doesn't work that way. You know, if if a migrant person does commit a crime, um, you know, then we can deal with that as we best see fit. But that doesn't mean that 
we can extrapolate that act to a broad swath of people. It would be like um, if, if a redhead kills someone, then we arrest and bar all redheads from a city. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but to go back to the central point that I think you're making so well, Justin, is that um, we really see it as a destructive force. That is what it is. When you when you look at it, when you understand it, or when you live in the communities or, or actually are able to cross the border or see those who are unable to cross the border, it's an incredibly destructive thing. We would be safer without borders, simply. Thank you both for a really, really needed conversation. Um, before we close, I want to remind people that if you're in a position to make a donation, no matter how small, please consider supporting Radical Publishing through the Venmo linked below. Thanks to Haymarket and Verso Books for organizing this live stream. Thanks to everyone who joined this call. We hope to see you at future events. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Justin. Thanks both. Really, really wonderful. Thank you. It was great having this discussion with you all.